like it. Um, the topic today is one that um, showed up. I'm trying to share the screen right now. There we go. Uh, early on for me, uh, I wrote a review paper back in 2011 uh, on climate and the danger of increasing surface temperatures for the earth and its future. I thought it would be interesting to take another look a decade later at what I was worried about then and see whether there's been any change uh, since that time. I'm not alone uh, at the March meeting in 2019, there was a poll taken of what issues mattered most to you. And I've put this on the screen because up to that time, it had always been research funding that was the dominant issue. This particular year, and it's not just the March meeting, also the April meeting and the DEMOP meetings, found that climate change was the issue that mattered most to physics, physicists. And so I thought it would be worthwhile then to explore that topic, to see just what it is that has alarmed so many and whether in fact it's caused by humans, anthropogenic contributions, or whether it's just a natural phenomenon. And finally, what are its impacts? What happens because of climate change, temperature increasing, beyond just temperature, also issues associated with the ocean, its pH and so on. And then finally, what we can do about it. And so that will form the presentation, namely first, is the average surface temperature increasing? Uh, if it is, who's responsible for it? And if, is there a human fingerprint that shows who is dominating the issues associated with climate change? And then if so, what can we do about it? And what are our future prospects? So first of all, is the average surface temperature increasing? Well, since I was going to give a talk in Minnesota, I thought you'd be interested in the Great Lake ice coverage it was down in 2020, that's January, at 35% of its average. And you can see Lake Superior and where Minnesota is. And this represented the fifth warmest uh, January on record for the United States. So something is melting the ice. It was in 2019, the second hottest year over a 140 year period. And compared to the pre-industrial average, around two degrees Fahrenheit higher in magnitude. And then, as I've noted from NOAA and NASA, the world's five warmest years have all occurred since 2015, with nine of the 10 since 2005. 43rd consecutive year, with global land and ocean temperatures above average. And this one actually has a double barreled effect. The ocean heat content was the highest ever recorded. And that's because the ocean is the principal repository of carbon dioxide. And a higher temperature and a higher pH will limit the amount of carbon dioxide that it can absorb. There were more findings for 2009. The polar sea ice continued its downward trend. Uh, the Arctic and Antarctic oceans recorded their second smallest annual uh, sea ice coverage. It was the second hottest December on record. And then the annual globally average sea surface temperature was the second highest on record, just behind 2016. And you can see in this little picture uh, how it looked in 2019 uh, as compared uh, to the average. Um, if you take a look 
since the Industrial Revolution really took off, which is 1880. In 1880, there was a transition from Britain to the continent of the technological capabilities associated with the Industrial Revolution. And of course, coal was the principal drive uh, for that energy that was required for the revolution. And we date, therefore, the change in temperature, global average, from that date. And it's pretty clear, as you look at the chart, where we are today and where we're going. Now, I'm going to use the cursor to point out the 2009 to 2010 period. You'll note that the average temperature was relatively constant and, in fact, went down towards the end of that decade. And that has been used by many as an argument against the human contribution uh, to global warming. Things happened in that decade, primarily volcanic emissions, which as I'll point out in the following slides, has a tendency to cool rather than heat. And as a consequence, that period represented an example of cooling the steadily increasing temperature increase. As you will see from the chart, the highest temperatures now that we've recorded are all in the last five years. If you take a look at the rate, that is the change in temperature per decade, if you look over a long period, that is uh, from the beginning of the 20th century to just about today, there's an average over that period uh, that is ex ex clearly given on the left-hand map of the globe. And if you instead look at the average increase over the last 20 or 30 years, you will see the difference, namely the acceleration of the average surface temperature of the Earth. And notice that it's not uniform, that in fact, there are some areas where it's become cooler, but in large part, over the surface of the Earth, it's increased substantially in terms of its rate of increase. Now, for those who may not be familiar with it, the greenhouse effect arises not from the nitrogen and oxygen, but rather greenhouse gases, which are really a rather small percent of our atmosphere. Nevertheless, they absorb the long wavelength uh, energy from the surface of the Earth, and they rem then remit it, re-emit it in all directions. And the result is a warm atmosphere. Now make no mistake, without greenhouse gases, we would be a much colder climate. And so what we're really looking at is the change from the historical period, which has given us the temperatures that we have enjoyed for many centuries, almost many millennia, uh, to the present day. The problem is that the greenhouse gases appear to be increasing the temperature far beyond our thermal average over the centuries. Now, the greenhouse gases I'll be addressing are carbon dioxide and methane. And the left-hand side of this chart is a historical view of the amount of carbon dioxide parts per million in our atmosphere. And notice there are three scales, one from 400,000 years ago, uh, then 2,000 years ago, and then the last 50 years. And you will see that over the last two millennia, it's been fairly flat, but then in the last 100 years, it started to rise. And the best method of taking a look at the CO2 concentration is the Mauna Loa Observatory, uh, where they measure daily the atmospheric CO2 level. When I first became aware of global warming, <laughs> those days we regarded as 380 parts per million as the upper, upper limit. You certainly don't want to have more concentrations than that. Well, we're currently, at least it's of January, at 414, 413 parts per million. And you can see the curve and see which way it's going. Also notice the slope of that curve. 
has increased quite substantially. If you look at methane, which is not often talked about, but it's a very powerful greenhouse gas, we would say that about 17% of the total radiative forcing currently uh, from greenhouse gases is due to methane. As a molecule, it's about 104 times greater than CO2, but that depends on the length of time over which you're doing the measurement and the average, and that's because its lifetime in the atmosphere is short. It's only about nine years. And so if you look, for example, at the following 100 years, it has about 28 times the impact on the temperature of a carbon dioxide emission of the same mass during that period. So it's a very powerful greenhouse gas and one that you really cannot ignore. Now the question is, is there an anthropogenic responsibility for this warming? And it's been a topic of political commentary, and I'm trying to avoid that in this talk. I'm going to quote from a very well-known and very highly respected scientist at Georgia Tech, Judith Curry, who testified in 2017 that it's an empirical fact that the Earth's climate has warmed overall for at least the past century. And then she says, and it's worthwhile quoting this, however, we do not know how much humans have contributed to this warming. And there is disagreement among scientists as to whether human-caused emissions of greenhouse gases is the dominant cause of recent warming relative to natural causes. That was in March of 2017. And I was interested in her perspective after the slides I've just shown you in 2020. So I went to her website and as she pointed out in her previous presentation, there are variations uh, because of solar variations, because of volcanic interruption, eruptions and also ocean circulation variability. And she pointed out that we're beginning to narrow uncertainty uh, that we can expect from all sources out to the middle of this century. Um, and all three of them tend to cool over the next three decades. And then she wrote, depending on the relative magnitude, decades with no warming or even cooling are more or less plausible. And then later on in the same website, for those who are worried about the impact of anthropogenic contributions to global warming, the need to act urgently may slow down because of these cooling effects. However, and I thought this was an important realization on her part, failure to anticipate and understand periods of stagnant warming or even cooling detract from the credibility of climate science and may diminish the will to act. I thought that was a very strong statement on her part, given her statements before Congress of three years earlier. And it frankly was the case in the first decade of this century. Over and over again, we heard, well, it's cooling, so why should we worry about it? Well, I think this last decade uh, may give you some concern about the surface temperature of the earth and its increase. The question is, is there a fingerprint of human contributions to these atmospheric uh, temperatures? And Ben Santer of Lawrence Livermore Laboratory has done an extensive study over the years of the human fingerprint. And these are long papers, but very important and very well grounded. One in Nature uh, talks about the vertical structure of atmospheric temperatures as a fingerprint. Uh, and then in the Academy of Sciences in 2013, natural external forces, volcanic eruptions, produce atmospheric temperature fingerprints that differ from the fingerprints of human-caused changes in greenhouse gases or aerosols. And finally, his conclusions in that paper Fingerprinting with atmospheric temperature changes has provided evidence, strong evidence, of a discernible human influence on global climate. 
It then went on to use, instead of the structure of the uh, troposphere, the seasonal variations of temperature. And in a paper in Science two years ago, talked about the human influence on the seasonal cycle of tropospheric uh, temperatures. And I won't read what's on the slide, but they focused on the troposphere uh, from the surface of the Earth uh, to tens of kilometers uh, above. And on what he did was to paste uh, his findings of these oscillations, these changes, onto a map of the Earth. And where it's red, uh, you see the increases in the annual cycle amplitude uh, of the tropospheric temperatures. What he concluded was there are seasonal signals in certain human-caused forcings. Um, and these are associated with ozone, ozone de depletion and uh, particulate uh, pollution. There are seasonalities in these feedbacks. Uh, there are widespread signals of seasonal changes in the abundances and distribution of species. The biological signals are med mediated by seasonal climate changes. Seasonal cycles of tropospheric temperatures, he concluded, provide powerful and novel evidence for a significantly significant human effect on Earth's climate. And then <laughs> statistically, the odds are roughly five to one to five in one million that the seasonal changes arise by natural variability alone. If you read these papers, I think you will see the scientific basis for arriving at anthropogenic responsibility for this heating. What was interesting to me was not just the next hundred years, but rather what are the long-term impacts of climate change? That is, it's all very well to talk about our human condition over the next century, which of course I won't be around to witness, but what about the long term? Well, from this paper, you will see that between 20 and 50% of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions uh, in the next 100 years will remain till the year 3000. Even more alarming, between 60 and 70% of the surface temperature anomaly and almost 100% of the sea level rise will remain after 10,000 years. And the ultimate return, assuming there's no more emissions after this 100 years of CO2, will not occur for hundreds of thousands of years. And then the conclusion, if CO2 emissions continue unchecked, the CO2 released during this century will commit Earth and its residents to an entirely new climate regime. I thought I would show some of the models that are associated with this century's release. And these are given in terms of the amount of CO2 which is emitted this century. And you saw from the Mauna Loa Observatory how that's increasing. And the bottom two figures are, you will see a pulse of the CO2 emissions over this 100 years. And you'll notice that there are four different sizes to those pulses and therefore the area underneath them. And they're measured in terms of the amount of carbon released into the atmosphere. And it's measured in terms of petrogarbon, petrogram, sorry, petrograms of carbon, which is a billion metric tons. And then above it, you will see models of what happens depending on the total carbon emission in just this 100 years out for 10,000 years. And if you look carefully, you will see for 1,280 petrograms uh, what the predictions are for, uh, temper for temperatures and for CO2 concentrations. And then as you go up, depending on how much we emit, you will see up to 5,000 170,000 uh, petrograms of carbon. So these two rely, uh, these four curves rely on the amount of carbon released this century. 
And it's important because we already know how much has been released in the first fifth of this century. And we'll come back to that in a moment. First of all, who's doing the emitting? Well, this is a plot by World Region of the CO2 emissions from uh, the early 18th century up to the last time that it was recorded in 2017. You will note that the very bottom is the, uh, per, the amount of carbon released by the EU countries and it's gone down rather substantially, at least visually, uh, over this period. You will see the United States has gone relatively constant. It actually is a slight decrease a few years ago, but has now begun to increase again. But the bad actor, of course, is China. And there is no evidence, at least on this chart, that its emissions are being reduced. And in fact, they are the major single contributor to the CO2 emissions. It will be helpful, I think, when you have your own time to take a look at who's doing what and their impact uh, on the CO2 emissions. Well, what happens uh, if you take those models, let's take the worst case, which is called RCP 8.5, um, and look at the surface temperature 21,000 years ago. That was the end of the last glacial maximum. And then the mid Holocene period about 6,000 years ago. And then the projections for the future based on the upper end scenario. Now that's the worst case scenario of over 5,000 petrograms emitted this century. And the colors will tell the story of the difference in surface temperatures as a consequence uh, over the years of climate change. If you ask where the consequences will come from, then if you take the minimum, that is 1,280 petrograms, uh, glaciers, melting of glaciers on the surface of the earth will account for a sea rise of about a quarter of a meter. And even under the worst case scenario, it's only a third of a meter. So glaciers are not going to have a huge difference, so that's not insignificant, but that's not where the problem lies. If you look at the Greenland ice sheet, it will, under the smallest uh, example, the 1,280 petrograms, the sea level rise will be four meters. That's now rather to be substantial, up to seven meters uh, for the highest petrogram numbers. But where the real problem lies is the Antarctic ice sheet. And it will cause the sea level rise from 24 meters to 52 meters, a huge change under the uh, four different scenarios that I've indicated. The reason that I'm giving this is that these exceed the IPCC, that's supposed to be forecast, not forest, forecast for 2100 by two to three orders of magnitude. That is, when you look out beyond this century, the time scale that we've been looking at is really fairly trivial compared to the total impact uh, on the Earth of global warming. And then below I have pictures of what the coverage of Greenland will look like uh, as compared to um, the present uh, under the highest scenario and the same for uh, the uh, ice sheet of uh, Antarctica. Now, um, one can say, well, perhaps I'm just being overly pessimistic, but the projections are not very positive. The current human carbon footprint is already, that is already in this century, approaching the low end scenario of 1,280 petrograms of carbon. So <laughs> the next 80 years, we've already reached one of the minimum projections over that period. And then as I write, and as I've quoted, emission scenarios are guaranteed 
to lead to temperature increases approach or exceeding the two degrees Celsius guardrail from the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. What's worse is that the high-end emission scenarios up to 5,000 petrograms become increasingly likely as this century continues and as the amount of carbon increases yearly in its uh, emissions into the atmosphere. And the point is that that's not a, a, a silly number, that so-called available ranges uh, are actually much larger than that, almost twice to three times larger in principle. But if you just take the high-end projections and you saw the consequences, they're becoming increasingly likely. And then again, 21st century global average warming will substantially exceed even the warmest Holocene conditions, producing a climate change, climate state, not previously experienced by human civilization. Well, that's where we're at, at least in terms of the best science. And then of course the question is, what can we do about it? And there was a lecture given by Jay Banner here at UT Austin. And I like one of the quotes that he put up about national governments are set to defend their respective interests, but cities, municipal ones, may be a hope where we can have impact. They're one of the few structures that are open to freely exchanging information. That's our competitive age. Governments don't do it, just go down the list, but cities do. And then, as he noted, a cautionary note, sometimes national and even state governments can sometimes get in the way. I won't go on to explain that any further. There have been responses by the cities, both in the United States and Canada and on a global scale. And there's a network of what's called urban sustainability directors, uh, which by the way, Minneapolis uh, is part of that. Mr. Kim Havey is a leader of the environmental program in Minneapolis, creating a network of local government professionals dedicated to create a healthier environment, economic prosperity, and increased social equality. Over 200 cities and counties participated in the United States and Canada, with a thousand local government professionals sharing ideas through the network. On a global scale, there is a Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. It's a global network committed to being carbon neutral by 2050. There are 12 nations, five continents, 62 million citizens, 5.7 trillion GDP. And these cities are taking a radical redesign of their core energy building transportation and waste systems to eliminate carbon emissions and improve the quality of life. I'm sorry to keep reading this for citizens, community and businesses. And you will see on the map that Minneapolis uh, is one of the participating uh, cities, which is a important statement. So it's global. And the question is, have cities done anything? Have they actually been able to make a difference? And I chose two cities to take a look at. One is San Francisco, and of course the other is Minneapolis. In San Francisco, they focused on what they call Focus 2030, a pathway to net zero emissions by 2050. And they focused on transportation, buildings, and waste. And I won't read all of this, you can read it yourself, uh, but they focus on electricity, on uh, space and water heating, building efficiency, and waste generation. And how are they doing? Well, they've, uh, really achieved the goals that they had set. In 2017, they achieved a 36% reduction in greenhouse gases below 1990 levels. And that's in the presence of an increase of population and their economy. And it surpassed the target 
of 25% by the Board of Supervisors. They believe that by 2030, they will be able to meet the targets that you see at the top of the levels, at the top of the slide. And these targets have already, as I said, been met insofar as the trajectory uh, is concerned up to the present time. How about Minneapolis? Well, there was a climate action plan which uh, was approved for greenhouse gas reductions in 2013. And greenhouse gas emissions, you will see, were decided or were projected to be reduced by 15% in 2015 30% in 2025 and 80% in 2050 using 2006 as the baseline. And how is Minneapolis doing? Well, here's a bar chart of their greenhouse gas emissions starting in 2006. And you will see in 2015 that horizontal dashed line, they've actually met the reduction target in 2015. Um, the reduction by 2025 uh, may be a little more challenging in that 2018 it went up slightly, uh, primarily uh, due to natural gas, as you'll see from the, the bottom uh, part of the increase. But nevertheless, that's the target. And then you see where they need to go, where you need to go by 2050. So there it is. There's a projection for Minneapolis. Where does it come from? The sources for carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas emissions are shown on this circle. The electricity is about a third, natural gas is about a, is 40%, transportation 24%, whereas the remainder is fairly small. And then if you look on the right hand side, you'll see the sharp increase in natural gas emissions uh, from uh, 2017 to 2018. So one has an idea of where the problems are and how one might address it. Notice the drop in electricity, and this is because of a relationship between the city and the providers of electricity to Minneapolis. The decision is based primarily on buildings. The argument is that building energy consumption is 73% of the total. And you will see the difference between residential and commercial for natural gas and electricity. So the issue then is what can be done in the building sectors. And the plans are the following, and I won't read all of these, but you're welcome to take a look at them at your leisure. Um, the takeaways are that greenhouse gas emissions are down by 17%, but that natural gas emissions are the largest source, and that building, primarily commercial and in industrial, continue to drive emissions. Um, they are concerned about reaching the 2025 goal, and they won't reach the 2050 goal until gas emissions drop by more than half. And then some of the actions are given on the right-hand side, and I will leave that up to you and the city as to uh, their implementation. But it is a plan for the future that is required if these goals are to be met. Well, let me... Um, end with prospects for the future. The first thing is it really does depend on us. It depends on the anthropogenic contributions and what we as humans do. Not doing anything will result in a climate change, climate state, not previously experienced by human civilization. And we don't have much time. 20 to 50% of the anthropogenic CO2 emissions will in the next 100 years, will be there in the year 3000. If we continue, the CO2 during this century will commit Earth to an entirely new climate regime. 
60 to 70 percent anomaly will remain and 100 percent of the sea level rise will remain after 10,000 years. We have opportunities at the city and private sector level, a pathway we hope to influence state and federal levels. And then finally, we really don't have much time. With that, let me end and thank you for the opportunity to present this. Wish everyone a healthy future. I hope that we can get together in person. All right, so now we uh, are opening the floor for questions. Uh, just use the hand, the hand, raise your hand option. Uh, Fiona, I'm uh, muting you so uh, you can ask your question. Yeah, I, I was wondering, um, so you talked a lot about, you know, policy decisions, which my understanding is that is where the focus is right now. Are there, you know, outstanding kind of science or technology um, you know, things that are, you know, that maybe physicists could have something to contribute to that you think could potentially um, have a big impact on the trajectory of climate change. You're, you're, you're muted right now. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, you have to mute yourself. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you saw in the Minneapolis uh, slide, uh, the really large importance of electricity and natural gas. Now, presumably those are energy related. And I think physicists participation in the energy field is really critical. Now, what can a physicist do? Well, uh, I happen to suggest ITER as an example of looking at controlled fusion, which is an experiment that is really being driven by the fundamental physics of fusion. Um, also, the issues of making more efficient and cheaper renewable sources, uh, in particular solar energy. There is a, a great deal of activity on artificial photosynthesis, uh, which has become, to, to many of us, it was just a pipe dream but it is turning out to be a very interesting opportunity um, where one can do things like splitting water uh, with sunlight and taking advantage of the energy of the sun, not only in terms of electricity, but also production of fuel. Um, another area that I happen to be part involved in is sequestration of CO2, which is a very technical field. Uh, it relies not just on pumping CO2 into the ground, but really what are you going to do with it? And there is a number of opportunities we've been looking at in Texas of uh, cycling uh, and absorbing in uh, aquifers and so on. I think focusing on energy is the one thing that seems to be the majority of the contributions uh, to global warming that we can influence. Okay, uh, so the next in line is uh, Shaul Hanani. I'm going to mute you and then you can ask your question. Go ahead. Hi, thanks. Um, so my question is about the discussion about anthropogenic uh, sources. A piece of uh, evidence that have you, you have not shown here is the strong correlations between temperature fluctuations over the eons and CO2 emissions. So, of course, correlation is not causation, but, but I think uh, the cor uh, correlation is very high. So, can't one argue that correlation has existed? Uh, now, we have very strong emissions that have not appeared any time in the last tens of thousands of years at slopes that we have not seen. And I think, uh, I think there's a, there's a question about anthropogenic source is not about the CO2, it's about the temperature. But you could say it doesn't matter. If the CO2 sources are anthropogenic and they're highly correlated to temperature increases, which we've seen in the past, why not take that as evidence that the temperature increase is anthropogenic as well? Um, because it is. <laughs> uh, the... That's no, but what the I'm, models sorry, do. Sorry, the, sorry the to interrupt. I just, you just showed that evidence from that other scientist in Georgia Tech. She was very, very skeptical in her language. And, and I'm just a little bit baffled about 
the skepticism? Well, first of all, she's a very fine scientist and is, has a wonderful track record. She just is trying to be as accurate as possible. I thought that the fact that there was a cooling period in the first decade of this century really did have a political and, and policy effect, in my view. It gave credence to those who argued that there was no anthropogenic uh, responsibility uh, for temperature increases. It isn't just a correlation. Uh, these uh, models have to do with radiative forcing. And it is a physics model where they take radiative forcing and from that determine the temperature change, taking into account both the uh, surface of the earth and oceans and other uh, uh, absorbents uh, and emitters uh, in their calculations. These are, uh, in my view, then not just correlations, but actually uh, models, simulations, if you like, that show the relationship between the CO2 concentration and the temperature increase. Is that an answer to your question? Um. So essentially, I think uh, what, what you're saying, which didn't come out as clearly as possible, is that um, while Judith has been very careful, there seemed to be almost irrefutable evidence that it is of anthropogenic sources. Uh, well, uh, when you say irrefutable, <laughs> uh, be careful. <laughs> uh, one of the problems is the statements that have been made that um, I'm trying to remember the, I, the how the IPCC was misquoted, uh, but it, everything is refutable. <laughs> there may be mistakes that even physicists can make. I think the real question is the balance of the evidence. And I thought that her change of language really suggests that she's now getting worried about anthropogenic contributions dominating temperature increases. Uh, what I'm trying to remember the word that was used, but th the problem is that in science, nothing is irrefutable. Uh, when we come up with ideas and they become common wisdom, they're sometimes completely wrong. And so be careful. <laughs> but yeah. the, the models are getting better and better. And they are physics models, they're not just uh, models that, that take uh, a qualitative picture. All right, thanks. I said almost irrefutable, but thanks, I understand. Thanks. Okay, so our next, uh, uh, Priska. Uh, go ahead, please ask your question. <laughs> Yeah, hi, this is not Prisca, this is actually Roger. I'm sorry. <laughs> Watching this together, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple of comments and a question. Um, the first comment was in response to your previous, what you're talking about just now, which is looking down at the earth from satellites, you can measure the notch in the absorption of CO2. And as I understand it, that's got broader in the past 30 years or so, which is a, an indication that the infrared radiation is being absorbed as it's being emitted from, from the earth, which is causing the, the temperature. I would have think that would be a very strong piece of evidence that CO2 is one of the driving forces for that. Um, the other comment <clears throat> I have, which is when talking about this to other people, one of the things which I always find convincing for is that 50, there's this story of the PETM, which is the Paleo Eocene Thermal Maximum, which happened 53 million years ago when there was this really enormous effect, which happened really quickly, like over a period of 10,000 years in geological terms, um, when something like five gigatons, or that's 5,000 petagrams, if I remember correctly, sorry, it's 5,000 gigatons was released into the atmosphere somehow, and it was mostly from, from plants. Um, and it took roughly 200,000 years for the five degree centigrade excursion that happened because of that to restore back to what it was before. And I think that's a whole, another line of argument, <clears throat> which is very useful for your um, discussion of really the long-term effects of what we're doing. 
But I'll get to my question, which is in the late 90s and the early 2000s, there were these models which made predictions for to, uh, to the amount of, you know, the amount of heat, heat in the oceans, the, the, <clears throat> the temperature, average temperature changes and so on. I wonder, could you comment on how well did they work now, 20 years later? And how well were the predictions, how, how accurate and were they within the errors or were they, or what, uh, which side of the error bars are we on those predictions? I'm, I'm not a, a source of absolute accuracy on that. My memory is that the error bars were quite large on those projections and that the current projections are within those error bars. But I, I don't want to say any more because I just frankly forgotten uh, the actual data. Let me say something about the satellite measurements. There's a very tricky problem with the simulations. And that is we can observe from the Earth up to a, the uh, troposphere what the temperatures are, what the CO2 is, and so on. And we can observe from satellites, as you just said, what CO2 and, and other, uh, uh, other molecules concentration are. The problem, and temperatures, the problem is in between. We don't know much about clouds. And now there are a number, there's an ARM program in DOE trying to take a look at the radiative forcing of clouds and so on. But there really is an unknown uh, between satellites and Earth observation that is, from what I understand, still being developed. Uh, and so th there's no perfect simulation that one can point to on the basis that it fits everything because we just don't know enough about what happens with clouds. That's what I understand currently. Oh, sorry, did you, did you have more questions, uh, Roger? Well, I just, uh, just a, a response to that in a sense. What, with that, with looking at the infrared spectrum and the notch caused by the CO2 and how it has got broader over the years, that's just a measure of the CO2, the effect of the greenhouse, uh, CO2 is a, a, for the forcing term, not, the, the clouds are like an additional term, an additional factor, but the CO2 you can really measure by that notch in the infrared spectrum. Y yes, indeed. But the temperature is the issue. <laughs> and the forcing, cloud forcing is still, from what I understand, not completely solved. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but uh, from what I've read, uh, that's still an, it's not an open question, but it, it is one that has yet to be made quantitative. Okay, uh, next question by Sharam Banajiri. Please go ahead. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you had any opinion on the role um, active climate engineering uh, should have uh, if any, on, on our fight against climate change. Uh, I've recently read a book by David Keith, who I think is a climate scientist himself, uh, who made, uh, in, in my uh, naive view, a pretty strong case that uh, uh, we should start um, funding research into climate engineering uh, so that we can uh, deploy the, uh, that on a, on a sort of a global scale, maybe like a few decades down the lane. But I was, I was, I was, I was wondering if you had any opinion on that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, when I was in DOE, the issue of geoengineering uh, came up. Uh, one of the difficulties is that we have one Earth. And if these experiments go wrong, We've got one Earth. Uh, for example, there was a proposal to dump huge amounts of iron into the ocean uh, in order to deacidify it. But that has consequences, and not all of them do we know. And similarly, things that we throw up in the atmosphere may have consequences. So I was very reluctant to follow that line. <sighs> I just it's very dangerous in my view and perhaps there will be some proposal that will be safe 
but right now I haven't seen any that I would like to see implemented. Okay, uh, Shaul, I see that your hand is is, lift, is, is raised, but uh, let's go to someone that hasn't asked the question yet first, uh, Jenny. Hi, um, th this was great. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say, I know there are some people outside the school who are tuned in and they maybe didn't get a copy of Professor Orbach's slides. And I have linked those now in the abstract on our calendar. And also there'll be a link to the recording of this later. And uh, if you're outside the school and you can't get the link to work, um, just please email me. Uh, and that's Jalen, J-A-L-L-A-N at U-M-N dot E-D-U. Okay, thanks, bye. Okay, uh, Shaul. Thanks. Uh, so uh, another question about uh, the idea of uh, harnessing cities. Uh, it's a very interesting idea. It's, I think it's a very promising approach. I'm wondering, though, whether it is realistic to assume that uh, without active involvement and active action by governments and states, uh, this problem can really be solved. Oh, <laughs> I understand. Um, I would hope, and this is a hope, that we're a democracy and that if enough action takes place at the city level, that it will have impact at the state and national level. The problem with this, when you're talking about national level is how much impact can we have as individuals? What are we going to do? I mean, we can vote and that's fine. But showing the way that the cities, for example, are doing, Minneapolis is one of them, uh, may put the pressure on both the state and federal level to do something. There are market issues, there are issues that are political in, their resp in response to the climate change. Not everybody will be happy about it, but it seems to me that, that where we as individuals can make a difference is local. And if enough local cities band together and start doing something as they are starting now in the United States and Canada, it can have a big impact. I live in Austin and the city of Austin has become very adventurous in trying to reduce carbon emissions. It has problems. Uh, we are stuck with a coal-fired generator uh, that we have invested heavily in years and years ago. And what are we gonna do with it? No one wants it, but it provides about a third of our electricity. So it's not simple. But there is a real movement to meet these climate goals that, for example, uh, your city has adopted in San Francisco and uh, across the world, really. So hopefully, excuse me, hopefully that will percolate upwards. The only way I see, apart from a, a major change in government that recognizes what we need to do, that we can change things. Okay, uh, next question. Well, either Priska or Roger are going to ask the question. <laughs> yeah, hi, it's Priska. Um, I wanted you to say a little bit about um, maybe it's politics, maybe it's realities uh, with respect to China, because as the um, the cost of um, you know solar cells and uh, solar power overall goes down. Um, and maybe because of the results of COVID-19 clearing up the air for a while and everybody enjoying it, do you see any, um, any uh, change in policy there that would begin to reduce coal uh, dependence on coal? Well, you saw the chart and they've been talking about solar and nuclear energy now for decades and yet their CO2 emission continues to go up. They are building a coal-fired power plant, one per week, okay? Why? They have a huge population that they are trying to meet the energy needs of, and they have no alternative from their perspective, but to produce the energy that is required. And so it's all of the above. 
unfortunately, the above includes a lot of carbon emission. They, I believe, are sincere about trying to reduce the amount of CO2, but they're also trying to meet the needs of their country. And you see the result. Um, these coal-fired power plants are dirty. Uh, you can sequester them in principle, but it's expensive. And so far, they haven't done that. And as they increase the number, is, to me anyway, at an alarming rate, I think their CO2 emissions will continue to increase. Now, at the Paris Accord, they essentially got an exemption up to 2030, I believe. Uh, they are allowed to increase until 2030, and then they can start to decrease. The difficulty with that exemption, in my part, from my perspective, is that you saw what happened underneath that pulse in the 21st century, that the damage may already be done. And certainly over the next decade, if they continue to increase, we are at the lowest level, if not one of those intermediate levels of carbon concentration. So to me, that exemption is somewhat ironic, uh, given the, the nature of the accord and the realities. OK, so since there are no more questions, I would invite everyone to uh, unmute their microphones to thank Ray Orbach. And again, uh, congratulate one more time the recipients of the uh, School of Physics and Astronomy Awards. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.